everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. For those of you who do not know what Impetus Digital does, is we're a company that has built um, the best-in-class asynchronous and synchronous virtual touch points in a platform that is being leveraged by pharmaceutical, medical device, biotech companies across the globe for things like advisory boards, investigator meetings, working groups, um, and certainly a lot of internal meetings that have happened, unfortunately, since COVID-19, things like brand, plan, brand planning, POA rollouts, and Salesforce training, et cetera. At Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a thought. When you have a thought, a conversation can, can initiate and great things can happen. And we believe that this is actually the start of some of these courageous conversations um, and being able to have these kinds of discussions with people like Christine Jacob and other innovators and entrepreneurs and provocateurs in the digital space that are going to help to positively disrupt healthcare. So without further ado, we're certainly very, very pleased to have Christine Jacob. She's a founder and managing director and digital strategist in healthcare at DigiBridges. Um, phenomenal background. Um, she is also a health tech researcher. Um, she's a lecturer and a very well-renowned uh, speaker. She brings more than 18 years of experience from Fortune 500 organizations. These are leading global, regional, and local roles. She's actually done um, many, many things across many companies, but mainly focusing on digital, which is my favorite topic. And she's the founder of DigiBridges, and we're gonna learn all about what that company does and very exciting things. And she helps clients to unleash the potential of using digital strategies in advancing healthcare. And as we know, especially since COVID-19, people are scrambling to the door to figure, figure this all out in a very accelerated way. So besides consulting, Christine is also a current PhD candidate, and she's a health tech researcher at ARU in Cambridge. And she teaches digital marketing and communications at the University of Applied Sciences in Northwest Switzerland. She's a thought leader in her area and was recognized as one of the top 100 key online influencers in digital health in 2016, as well as being the top 30 health IT influencers in 2019. So welcome, Christine. So pleased and happy to have you uh, in our fireside chat today. Thank you so much, Natalie, for the introduction. Very happy to be with you today. It's awesome. So we see from your background that you have worked in a variety of Fortune 500 companies. You worked at Roche, you worked at Novartis. A lot of these roles were in the digital strategy. Um, so tell us why, when, and why you made the jump into running your own company or becoming an entrepreneur. Maybe you can take us through your journey a little bit. Definitely. Uh, so as you just said, I, I had several years in big pharma, always focusing on digital. And one of the things that always that I always struggled with, and many of us in pharma struggled with, is that we kept creating really good tools that are addressing real needs that don't necessarily get adopted. And I wanted to have the neutrality and the freedom to be able to bridge between all the stakeholder groups that come to play to make such tools a success. But of course, as you probably you know, through your experience, being embedded in the corporate world, representing a specific product or a specific brand name does not always give you the freedom to talk to a patient expert or to a physician while keeping the neutrality and going there with an open mind to really understand their perspective. And it was at that time that I really wanted to have this freedom to be able to move between the different stakeholder groups, really understand the different perspectives and be able to play an active role in bridging those worlds, in helping them see each other perspectives. So that's from one side. But from the other side, as you said, I have a quite diversified portfolio. So I really like academic research. I really like teaching. And I wanted to make sure that I'm keeping the balance between those different bits and pieces of my activities. So it was these two uh, drivers that, that pushed me to start my own company back then. I had no clue if it's going to work. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to give this a year and see where it takes me because otherwise I'm going to always regret. I'm always going to ask, would it have been a success? And I've never looked back since then. That's wonderful. And when did you start um, your company? 2016. 
2016. So not that long ago, and obviously have done really well. So let's spend a few minutes dissecting some of the core asset services. What does DigiBridges do? Uh, so I mainly work with uh, pharma companies and uh, technology providers. Uh, I usually bring those together, but I also bring the users to the table. So I ensure that we always have clinicians and patients included. So ensure have those voices heard on the projects. So things that I, uh, I really like to work on are co-creation projects, for example, in digital health. So a pharma company comes with an idea or a need, and then we, could, we can marry them to one of the digital health startups with all the know-how of the technology and the agility of a small a startup and a full team just dedicated for the solution. We could create, create a module together and then test it with the users. But what I like to do differently is that I'd like to bring the users on board from the beginning so that they would become partners and co-creators, not just testers at the end. So they come early on on the process. And my role is always to orchestrate such studies to ensure that there is balance between the different perspectives. So this is done through tools like some of what you offer as in, at impetus, like things that facilitate an online ad board, for example, that facilitate the discussion uh, online surveys and collecting feedback from the different people that are coming into the discussion and ensuring that we have actionable insights at the end from this sort of feedback. So what can we do then to make things succeed? Um, uh, I also work on things like uh, user experience research or e-health assessment guides to upskill organizations to help educate the workforce, especially in, in big companies that don't necessarily have all the skills in-house. So help landscape uh, the, the, the different areas of digital health and help people understand that. Uh, I also work together with the different stakeholders to map the user journeys, both for clinicians and for patients, to ensure that we identify the different digital opportunities across the journey and ensure that we're offering them a solution that takes into account their whole journey, not just one piece, because that's usually what, what make those tools fail when it doesn't take the whole journey into account. So these are just a few examples of projects that I help with my customers with. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. It sounds incredibly comprehensive. And I also really appreciate the sharing of being able to, to as an entrepreneur and as a business owner, to be able to have the freedom to look at the collective and the comprehensive, which makes it very special and very useful and valuable to pharmaceutical companies. So as we're sort of thinking about user engagement strategies, um, tell us a little bit about what you have discovered over the last few years about some of these best engagement processes or protocols um, or other types of um, materials or products that you have found uh, over the last few years? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so one of my key eye openers was when I discovered that adoption is a multifactorial process. It goes far beyond technology. And in most cases, when we do user, user research and user engagement, we're too focused on the features and on the tool at hand. So making sure that in my projects that we cover all those contextual elements was one of the key learnings that I had. So understanding that the tools, the technological tools in healthcare are different than other techno technological tools that address a specific single user need because you have people with comorbidities, they are treated by multidisciplinary team. And if you're only looking at one single tool, you're overlooking so many things that could bring tremendous value to this tool and make it a game changer as opposed to just this little tool. So uh, making sure that the Users are embedded in all the life cycle phases since the beginning, since the ideation until the delivery, not just testers at the end with something that we've already created is super important. So whenever the customer wants to test a demo, I try to help them structure the discussion in a way that starts with an open mind. Just listen at the beginning. Don't just start by testing something you've already assumed will work because you might go blindsided here. You might think that you've covered all your grounds, but in reality, there are things that could add really good value that you've not seen. So I help them steer the discussion in a way that really captures the, those feedbacks that might go uncaptured if you just go to the users as testers. Um, so 
Another thing is that, that brings value with this approach is uh, an example I had with one of the MS patients that I've been working with before. She's a patient expert, and she has been invited to collaborate with a portal from patients and to patients for disease awareness and life hacks. And she had to drop out of the project because she said, well, they gave me a list of topics that I should talk about. It felt like they're putting words in my mouth. They wanted to talk about traveling with MS when my real struggle was the day I pissed my pants because I couldn't find my keys to get to my apartment. Those are my real pains. And it seems that there's a disconnect here. So it looks like user engagement on the surface, but when you dig deeper, so many times in those projects, we go there with something to test or something that we have already pre-assumed before the discussion with the users. And this doesn't really lead to the best results at the end. So um, that's, that's my notion of user engagement that truly engage and bring the ideas of those users to the, the tools that we are creating as opposed to just testing something we assume will work with them. So I think you bring up some, a really, really important concept here. Um, when we talk about computers, we talk about that bias in the algorithm. But when we're talking with human beings and organizations, we're talking about pre-derived ivory tower thoughts and beliefs and group think, um, as you've mentioned, already reached the derivation or the hypothesis. And then it's almost like, you know, the, the testing is sort of the aftermath or the confirmation as opposed to real testing, which I think probably speaks to your PhD and the essence behind real uh, hypothesis um, and data generation. So in your perspective, you mentioned this idea that people have already had construed concepts of tools and things, and then they just want to test, or they have predetermined ideas about messaging and positioning, and they want to place that on patients to be participating in, in whatever uh, services or promotion. What are some of the, tr uh, the tools or the methods that you have been successful in employing in trying to tease out some of that confirmational bias um, and truly working with people who really want to change, are really open, and also want to be able to implant your services very early on in the development so that it's not coming in at the tailwind where leadership or the CEO has said, hey, there's this great new shiny tool, let's use this. So what have you actually done to try to backtrack that and truly make these um, user generated? So it doesn't always work, I must say. And historically, since I was with big corporates, uh, there was usually very little budget uh, geared towards things like user experience research and testing and this sort of stuff. Uh, I think from one side, because it's a quite pricey thing to do primary research and to really bring those people compliantly to the table and ensure that you have the dialogue facilitated. Uh, so it's, it's not easy from a compliance perspective nor from a cost perspective. Uh, but what I try to do to convince my customers is that I bring evidence from the research that shows them examples of what can happen when you don't really listen from the beginning or when you don't incorporate the feedback in all sorts of uh, all the different phases of the cycle of your tool. Uh, so I bring them examples that where things backfired when you didn't really include those people on board all the time. Like last year, end of last year, there were in the news an example of a diabetes app, a really successful one that got in real trouble when hundreds of thousands of patients started reporting suicidal thoughts through the tool and the tool was not set in a way that would enable the specialist to transfer such person to the other specialist that could take care of such a problem. But if you look from the beginning to the, to the sort of side effects of diabetes, you will find that a big percentage of people suffering from diabetes having mental health issues. And if you had facilitated feedback loops from the beginning to ensure that you stay relevant in a way that adapts to the change that's going. You wouldn't have waited until you have hundreds of thousands of problems coming to your place and that your problem is now in the news, right? So ensuring that you have those users embedded in your development cycle and the constant development of your tool, plus ensuring that you have feedback mechanisms that enable that feedback to reach you on time and also to 
sort of prioritize the feedback in a smart way that enables those relevant feedbacks to make their way back to the development so you stay relevant and you stay really useful, right? So what I try to do is that it's just evidence-based. I just show them, hey, look, you know, this could go south if you don't take that into account because we have examples from the reality that showed that if you don't have those mechanisms from the beginning, it can go wrong. And of course, it's, it's a multitude of other factors internally in the organization that would enable, like facilitate this discussion or not. But in many cases, they do listen and they do start having this on board since the early stages of the, the cycle and until after the launch. Because sometimes the attitude is the app is out or the tool is out, done. Uh, the job is now done. And what I try to explain all the time to them is no, that's, the, that's only the start of the journey you have a whole lifetime of the tool that you need to ensure that you are having your users engaged during all those phases. It's not done because the only single, the single change, the single constant now we see is change, right? So we need to stay relevant by making sure we are constantly talking to the users. We are constantly developing those tools in a way that makes them stay relevant and useful. So we're talking a lot here about really the concept of patient centricity. Now, you and I both know, as many listeners to this, this uh, video are also going to see, is that we've used that term very loosely and, you know, very dominantly over many, many years. But are we actually doing it? Are we actually focused on the patient? Now, when we're talking about the embedding of technology, I guess the question comes down, at least what I'm getting from you here is pharma, medical device, you know, life science companies seem to be very open to it at the point of launch and potentially onward. So much more at a commercial level. Um, do you have any words of wisdom on how, uh, how these technologies can be implied even earlier on at the time of clinical trial development? Are these discussions that are happening now and are these discussions more prevalent and more pronounced after COVID-19 than prior to this? Yes, so there are definitely uh, uh, initiatives, very successful ones, uh, even from a clinical trial level. And, and that's, that's uh, super important for the sustainability of those tools because at that stage you can really build scientific evidence of the effectiveness of such tools because in the, the, the environment of a clinical trial you can really me measure all the health benefits of such tools. It's not just user research where you are um, measuring things like efficiency, ease of use, useful, usefulness, but you're actually looking into real healthcare outcome that's coming out of such a digital tool. And I've seen really a few brilliant examples that are going in that direction. Now with the, with the COVID-19 question, that's another thing. Um, so we've seen, uh, of course, a lot of surge in the, in the adoption these days. We've seen mergers and acquisitions. We've seen the numbers really hike up, even in, in, in cases where, where doctors did not necessarily use that before they started using it. So it proved that it worked. At the very same time, we see that there are also challenges that are still persisting. So there were just last week or the week before in the news talking about healthcare insurance wanting to scale back telemedicine quotas to the pre-COVID-19 era, which creates tons of frustration both on the physician side and the patient side, because now it proved that it works and we saw that it really does and they want some, some parties, some stakeholders want to go back to the old ways of doing things. Uh, also, there are some regulatory issues in some countries, depending on where you are operating. Like in some countries, for example, telemedicine is allowed for follow-up, but not for the first exam. So if I'm going for the first examination, I wouldn't be able to have telemedicine only if it's a follow-up. So how do you overcome that to have sustainable, this sustainable growth in adoption, there are still radical things that need to be looked at. Also some of the interoperability issues. I mean, in the time of COVID-19, if I have a tool that is not interoperable, I might still do that manually in the hospital because I know I can spare a life by doing that. But would I do that after the pandemic? So it's all those things that we keep to, that we need to keep in mind so we don't end up with this romanticized idea of, oh, this is now booming and it's never gonna 
go back. Yes, it is booming. It gave it a really good push. So it gave it a good push from a social individual perspective. So the people that didn't have experience before with such tools now have it. So that challenge can now be overcome in a much easier way. But there are some other things that are on a regulatory level, like reimbursement policies or things that have to do with infrastructure, like interoperability, that especially across Europe, for example, we don't have a harmonized uh, infrastructure for the hospital systems. So it's, it's really very difficult for providers to be able to be interoperable with all the different systems out there. So you need a, a policy push and a regulatory push, infrastructure push to really have sustainable change in that area. So we're seeing a lot of these regulatory and legislation changes taking place in a very accelerated rate for things like software as a medical device, we're seeing those changes with the NIH and with the FDA and with Health Canada and other, um, and other jurisdictions. So there is some progress, although the, the wild card question is, like you said, is this going to be backtracked as yeah. soon as we get, quote unquote, the infamous vaccine that's going to, you know, make everything come back to normal? Yep. So it's, it, you know, I think a lot of us realize that it's never going to be quite, it's always going to be the new normal. So ultimately, um, there's, there's a lot at stake here, and there's a lot of questions about how to progress whatever has already been accelerated and is at the table today. So I think one of the questions for a lot of the pharmaceutical companies is, let's just say, for example, they decided to work with a vendor who's mm -hmm. created an interesting app for diabetes indication, and there's a whole series of things. Let's just say that they, were, they had the wherewithal to include that app from the inception, maybe with clinical trials and then following patients right through so they can actually gather real world evidence, et cetera, et cetera. At what sorts of guidance do you provide to, to an organization like that in terms of potentially applying this medical device as a, an extension to their, to their patent especially if the product is, you know, for example, reaching loss of exclusivity, mm -hmm. or B, applying for this, you know, through the FDA or through the NIH as a new, you know, as a software, as a device, as a new extension, as a new brand, new franchise in their organization, um, potentially taking it through clinical trials so that they can get reimbursement. What part of that do you play or role do you play in that, those discussions um, and in those applications? So the regulatory part and the certification part certainly needs a, speciali a specialist that studied law and is really focusing on that. So the formal paperwork has to be done by someone that's really specializing only on that. However, I definitely give guidance and advice on what features would make this become a medical device, for example, so that they would have to go through the whole process. But also, most importantly, because if you want to go through the certification and if you want it to be part of your beyond the pill approach, then you really need something that fits into, from one side, the clinical workflow of the clinician, so it becomes standard of care, and with the overall treatment plan of the patient, so it's not a burden on them. Like one of my really good patient expert friends said once, being a cancer patient is a full-time job. So what I help the discussion, uh, where I help the discussion is taking those contextual factor, factors into account, making sure that they do things like uh, not only interoperability, but also integration. So I'll tell you a silly example, or maybe people think it's silly, but in reality, it's not. A lot of research has brought up that uh, one of the key challenges with tools like mobile health is login issues, logging in. And that's for, for a big part is because clinicians have tons of systems to log into every day, <laughs> every hour. And that's another um, password that they have to deal with. And they hate it. And sometimes in my research, I'm talking to a clinician and they're like, yeah, it's a really good tool. I haven't logged in two months though, because I lost my password and I just didn't have time to renew it, stuff like that. And an example of how you can work on embedding that in the system is that goes beyond the things like interoperability and EMR integration is the integration into the system of the hospital itself. So one of the, uh, 
uh, tools that I've been uh, researching worked together with the hospitals to enable badge login. So they would just scan the badge, their badge that they used to get into the hospital to log into the system and into the app. And that was for them a, a super lifesaver, as silly and simple as it sounds, but it became a natural way of embedding this into their workflow because they already have the badge, you just scan it and you're in. So it's this seamless integration, not just interoperability, but how does it fit into the overall workflow? Looking into patients' needs and some, some of the cases where you have things like psoriasis, when you have the, the skin problems, but also you have the arthritis part of things. And these are usually treated by two different specialists. So how do you make sure that you have this, you're facilitating this multidisciplinary exchange between the two worlds so that you're offering a complete service to the patient. You're really making their life easier. So those are the sort of discussions that I help them steer and I help them have. It's how can you succeed into making this a natural part of a clinician workflow or a patient daily life and daily struggles. Um, so I hope this makes it a little bit uh, clearer. It, it totally does. And I, you know, you're, you're, when we talk about habit formation, I'm thinking about a book by James Clear called Atomic Habits. So not only does it apply to patient adherence or utilization of these apps, but it certainly also applies to the physicians. As, you, as you've mentioned, workflow is part of habit formation. It's part of human automaticity. And until we have that, there's too many barrages of people trying to grab our attention. Um, and so a lot of times our natural defense mechanism is more of a subtraction than an addition of new technologies, of new things. And so if something's already integrated, if a sensor is already built into our computer uh, keys where we don't have to enter things and it just reads our vibrations and can determine if we're, you know, having or starting neurogenerative disease as an example, it's a much more seamless um, mechanism to creating habit. Yeah. So I think what's, what's an interesting concept here is workflow habit formation, but I think there's also a piece around um, organizational centeredness and a gravitas around adoption. Yeah. And a lot of times either leadership says, yes, thou shalt do this, and it goes a very high top down and as it sprinkles down into the organization, it kind of gets lost in translation. And people hope that the CEO eventually forgets about this newfound shiny tool. Or conversely, it can start very organically at the ground level, but the individuals that you're working with does, don't really necessarily have the organizational or political savviness to drive change internally. So it also deadens at the trailhead. So, do you have any words of wisdom on the best way for more global adoption, even if it's just starting within a hospital or an institution? Yes, so that's definitely one of the key challenges. So decision-making in hospitals with more or less every research participant I've talked to was a challenge. So there is lack of clarity on decision makers. So even the decision is not taken that, that quickly. Uh, who to uh, include in the decision. So sometimes people want to have it on board, but there's no one actually to pull the trigger and say, okay, we're gonna do this. Uh, um, and as you said, sometimes people on the ground, they wanna have it, but they don't necessarily have the budget or the push or the authority to bring it on board. Uh, there are two, two ways to, to, to think about that. So from one side, it's evidence generation. So ensuring that you have research in place that shows value of those tools because in many cases you look at those tools and they look really sexy they look really useful but there's no really good rigorous research that shows if it adds value or not there's tons of white papers floating around which is great because you know you can write whatever you want on your own website but for a scientist or a, or a hospital manager they want to see rigorous peer-reviewed research that shows efficiency efficacy usefulness um, clinical impact and you name it. So from one side, to be able to talk to those specialists, you need to bring some value to the table and tell them, hey, here, we've done our research and this is the value we can bring it, we can bring it to you. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, trialability is a key factor for adoption. Enable them to have a trial with 
either that's either free of charge if possible or just at cost so depending on what the provider can offer but having a pilot project that enables them to test the tool and see how it works for them also encourages adoption to a very big extent to that so that's another another thing that that you can do uh, with them partnering with them in order to to let them try it and see how it goes. Another thing is uh, because they are super stretched and they don't have time to try things that might or might not work, endorsements and social pressure plays a key role here. So many times I would be talking to a clinician in my research and I would say, well, so what would make you adopt something? And the first thing that comes to their mind, if a trusted colleague told me it works. So, and that's something we, we usually overlook, right? So, Working with key opinion leaders or working with associations, well-established trusted associations that can test, test such tools and endorse them, for example, can build the trust that would then enable you to have those early adopters come on board and try things out. So there are different ways to approach it. It's not a, it's not a clear cut uh, answer. It's really finding ways to be able to gain the trust of some people that are super busy they cannot you know, gamble with the lives of people or the health of people. So you want to bring the evidence, enable them to try it and bring that trusted voice that tells them, hey, actually we trust that, it's, it actually works. Yeah, very um, good. And I think the, the other key component to this is that energy goes where the money flows. Yeah. And right now with the way certain drugs are set up, as you know, companies go to great lengths to ensure that there's, there's appropriate coverage that it's a well laid out plan, that they have patient support programs so that people know how to go about getting their drugs paid for. In the case of software as a medical device or just as a tool for adherence and a, and a myriad of other, um, uh, other benefits, the question comes down is who's getting paid? Mm -hmm. And so even with the recent discussions of potentially pulling back payment for things like telehealth sessions, it starts to make healthcare providers a little nervous, a little reticent about, you know, starting to prescribe or starting to use some of these things that they're not going to quote unquote get paid for. Yeah. So what sorts of legislation, advocacy, lobbying needs to take place at a, um, at a regulatory level for you to see the day where we have almost like a digital pharmacy mm -hmm. and you know, online or otherwise or integrated into the EMR system or the institution systems that people could go in and pick and choose or it's part of the treatment algorithm that people can choose as part of the treatment focus. Yep. How easy or difficult can this be for them to do this? Um, and what sorts of changes need to happen um, for, you know, uh, changes need to happen around reimbursement and access? Yeah. So we have a really good example that's happening now in Germany, and I think that's unprecedented. So they have now the Digital Health Act uh, that was decided end of 2019, and it's coming uh, into place now. So now I think last month and this month, they are evaluating the first apps that will start being used next month. So we're soon gonna see the impact of this, but what Germany did is that they said, well, if you have an app that has a patient interface, you can get reimbursed if you go through the process and ensure that you go through the assessment process that, that the, 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 the specialist bodies are doing. So you end up to be part of the prescription. So the doctor can prescribe it to the patient and it's automatically reimbursed. You just need to make sure that you're in that catalog. So you go through the assessment process and then you're part of the treatment, which is amazing and can be a real game changer because that's, that's a huge market. And now I'm, I'm really waiting to see how this is going to develop because it's, it's a first, we don't have this anywhere else in the world. And if that starts succeeding, I believe a lot of countries will probably follow suit, especially with more research that shows things like efficiency and efficacy of such tools and the sort of also economic gains that they can bring. As you just mentioned, see where, where you can save money, where you can bring some efficiencies. Um, so I hope that this will foster adoption quite a bit to a point where we can really see how it looks like when it's mainstream and it's really part of the natural prescription that a, a, a patient can have. Absolutely. I think another interesting question that pharmaceutical, medical device, biotech companies need to consider as they start thinking about digital 
digital integration, digital tools, digital as you know, software as a medical device, et cetera, or as a treatment, uh, treatment tool or a therapeutic is um, intellectual property. In the theoretical sense, uh, pharmaceutical companies are not IT companies generating algorithms and software and machine learning. They're usually working with other organizations. And now in this world, there's multiple different um, people working together in different consortiums. Um, do you actually have any insights as to the legal ramifications of moving digital forward, either as therapeutics or as medical devices? What sorts of things should pharmaceutical co uh, companies consider at the get-go um, on these issues about intellectual property and licensing and how they profit from this over time? Yeah, definitely. So the, the, this is really a question where one size does not fit all. It's really a case by case thing. And it's a hard discussion that has to happen between the technology provider and the farm company that's investing in whatever tool it is. In most cases, it's usually a technology provider that had an initial tool and then they had a partnership with the pharma company to create an additional module, for example, or an additional feature or an additional form of that tool so that the pharma company does not just absorb the initial tool, but there is some sort of specificity in that collaboration. And of course, this has to be uh, contractually clear since the beginning. Uh, because, of course, the pharma companies comes with all the scientific and disease area know-how. And then the technology provider comes with the platform and all the agility of a startup and the technology know-how and the, the workforce to keep such tool alive 24-7. And a lot of responsibility as well from an AE reporting perspective and you name it. Uh, so having those discussions early is very, very important. So you don't end up in a situation where you develop something and then you're fighting over intellectual rights and proprietary rights. Uh, so I've seen that happen smoothly before. It's not the easiest discussion, uh, but yes, it's possible if you keep it in mind from the beginning and ensure that it's, it's clear for both parties and it's built in a win-win way that, that really sort of keeps it fair and balanced for both. Very good. We have recently in Canada, the US, I'm sure across Europe and other areas across the globe have been entertaining these ideas around contact tracing since, COVID since the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And one would think that implementing a technology as robust as this to be able to track effectively, efficiently and, and cost effectively um, would be a no brainer. But we obviously know that it's not as simple as it appears. And one of the key issues has to do with the never ending consideration around surveillance, around security, and around health data privacy. Lots of concerns about data going to things like insurers and payments. Um, you know, what does this mean for job prospecting? If you have a disease or you don't have a disease. So there's a lot of questions and the contact tracing app is just an accelerated discussion of, of what it can be. Um, and as we start talking about apps and, the, and the, uh, the data that it collects and the data lakes that go in and the aggregation of information, how data is the new oil, and then companies coming back and saying, well, it's the oil, but we're the ones who are refining it. So we own the data and we get the money for the data. So in this big ball or this, you know, this meatball of entanglement of, of issues, what are your thoughts and the discussions that you have with the parties that you work with around privacy, security, and surveillance? Yeah, I think I do believe that data is the new oil. And I think healthcare data is a very, very expensive type of, of oil. Uh, however, I believe that there are still challenges to be taken into account if we want really to talk about monetization of healthcare data. So we, we see a few uh, initiatives like here in Switzerland, there is the Health Bank Co-op in Switzerland, where they invite people, for example, to input their health data. And then if there is a research in Uni Zurich, for example, they get a message telling them, hey, your disease um, could be relevant for this study and you could get an amount for, of money for sharing your anonymized data with us. So there are initiatives, actually small ones, that are starting this. Uh, also in the NHS in the UK, because it's the biggest central place where you have such health data in one place of a whole nation, so you have millions of them. They started evaluating the, 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 
value of healthcare data. And they said, well, for one patient, it's about perhaps 100 pounds. However, if you add the genetic data, this jumps to 1,000 to 5,000 pounds. So it is super valuable. However, when you really look to what's, what's happening uh, on the ground, you will see that we still have too many things to sort out uh, before we can say we can really benefit from this and that we can really protect the people that are sharing their data. So one of our hopes is probably blockchain because it can remove the middleman, it can have this decentralized approach so I can own my data, share it anonymized when needed or if I like and perhaps gain money for it. But still, we are still to see real life examples where this really happened seamlessly. Uh, looking at healthcare data, one of the key things that if, if we're looking not just at COVID-19 and contact tracing, I mean, if, if we are just looking at that example, of course, we had all those uh, discussions around centralized, decentralized approach. Where does the data live? So uh, here in Switzerland, for example, whatever uh, contact tracing data is collected from me through the app is on my device. The only time it would exchange with a central place is if I test positive. That's the single time I, I would be visible centrally. Otherwise, it's decentralized. Everything of places where I go and all the, the encounters that I have are only on my device. So that's a decentral, a, a, a decentral way of doing it. it. It protects privacy to the maximum extent because at a point where someone tested positive, you do need to share that to protect others. So that's the COVID example. But generally speaking, for healthcare, First of all, it's still a very paper-based culture. So you have tons of papers floating around hospitals. And when they decide to digitize it, it's a ton of PDFs floating around. <laughs> so imagine data mining in those tons of PDFs at the end of the day, it's not searchable, it's not aggreg uh, aggregatable, you cannot aggregate that. Uh, also, even in EMRs and, and in the systems in the hospital, you don't have uh, a standardized way of registering information. So classifying patients, the classifications, the names that they use, the codes they use, they are very hospital specific. You're lucky if you have a group of hospitals that have the same standard. So all of these from a feasibility perspective makes it still a very long way to go. So we need to have some standardization and harmonization there. We need to put some investment in the anonymization of data because there's a lot of studies that have been done on big amounts of data that showed that it's, it's still traceable. You can really track it back to at least somewhere around the person where that, that information came from. So you don't want that. So you need to invest in this anonymization of data. And to help hospitals do that, you need to incentivize them, give them an incentive actually to spend the time and money to have this anonymized data to deal with not to mention, as you said, the AI bias uh, that, that we're facing every day. So because the data we collect in many cases is not diverse enough, we end up with pools of data that are lacking diversity. And historically, scientific research has always been male and white, right? So even there's tons of papers about women having a cardiac arrest or a heart attack that is not recognized because most of the research follows the symptoms of white males that does not always apply on females. And the same happens with, with collecting those mega amounts of data. Like if, you talk, if we talk about the iWatch clinical trials these days about minim, uh, women health and uh, the relationship between movement and heart health. So all these, they are directed to iPhone users and those are usually not the, 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 the least socially um, uh, Accepted. lucky people of the of the of the society, right? So it's yeah. it's a, it's a it's an expensive one. So you're still you're still overlooking huge social classes out of such amazing trial, in my view, because for the first time we're able to really collect millions of data points that would enable physicians to treat with a very highly personalized way, right? And that's what what we aim to have at the end. That would bring tremendous value because then you're not dealing with this one size fits all sort of treatment plan, but it's something that addresses that person specifically, which is, would be a dream come true and such wearables could allow that, but still the bias in the collection would put the results at risk or would screw the results in ways. 
so these are all different things that we need to take into account before being too excited about the data. That's why whenever I'm having a, a discussion with a client, I tell them, hey, look, data is amazing. And we do want to make sure that this benefits the patients at the end, because collecting the data, it's not about surveillance and it's not just about knowing things about them. It's about offering them better healthcare at the end. And that's what sometimes is forgotten in the discussion or is not as clear in the equation. So yes, we want to do that, but these are the things we need to take into account to ensure that we're doing this from one side compliantly and properly and from the other side in a manner that would allow aggregation, anonymization and real benefit at the end. I love all those thoughts. There are so much juicy tidbits in that that we could literally linger on that for days, but so many good nuggets of wisdom. I think what you bring up, which is the precision medicine of N equals one is the optimal of what we're all seeking. And I think what's really interesting is there's a lot of companies today that are starting on that harmonization at the clinical trial um, or the journal article level, where there's almost like a template at which journals, as you know, are written, and there's a neural network, a sort of way of classifying data to be able to do quick research and basically the revealing of key insights, et cetera, by going through hundreds, if not thousands of articles and being able to spit up responses very quickly. I guess the concept will be eventually to do that with EMRs so that you can actually annual, um, aggregate and start doing population management at an N equals one level. So. Very exciting stuff. Um, one of the other questions that comes down to is the different variety of technologies. We talked a, a lot today about what's sort of the mainstay or mainstream right now, which is really app development, probably wearables, sensors, those sorts of things. We're starting to get more into the movement of sensors embedded in our, on our, in our clothing. We certainly wear it. Um, but I'm actually just curious about some of the more leading edge types of technologies, Christine, that you're seeing, that you're particularly excited about, everything from virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, I'm also thinking about 3D bioprinting. What, what are some of the things that you're seeing that you think really has some legs for the future? Um, I believe there's a bunch of them, and uh, my hope is that they will come together in a way that 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 make us benefit from from all the different strength of of those tools. So, uh, VR and uh, augmented augmented reality, VR AR are uh, really um, showing a lot of uh, promise in in the healthcare industry. Um, there are some some trials that and some research that has been done with, for example, burn patients, and they realized that. Uh, VR can help them when they are changing uh, um, for their burns more than sedatives sometimes. So if you use VR together with a sedative, then they can go through the process in a more distracted way. So they wouldn't feel the pain as much as they would feel it without the VR intervention, which is great and amazing because if you know about burn patients, that's one of the most painful processes anyone can go through. And no matter how, me how much sedatives they take, it doesn't ever eliminate the pain, especially when they're changing. Uh, so something like this is very, very helpful for someone who's suffering from such a condition. And it's, 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 it's really, it really shows through measurement that, that it can minimize pain through such processes. Another area is serious games, for example, or clinician training. Uh, a lot of hospitals used it also during the time of COVID-19 for things like intubation training, because usually such training happens, you know, um, eventually over a few months with real patients. But if you want to train a big amount of clinicians in a very short time on such a thing, what could you have better than augmented reality or virtual reality to have this immersive experience that enables them to go through the whole thing without really having a real patient at hand? Um, another area I'm really excited about, and I think the future, the future will witness a lot of changes there, is sensors and wearables, uh, because these would enable remote continuous monitoring, so that the, the hospital at your home and all those th the stories that we hear healthcare visionaries talk about, and the beauty of wearables and sensors is that you get rid of the human error or human bias uh, compared to apps where the patient is inputting those things manually. 
So you have something that's measuring those vitals and measuring, you name it. So you, you have things that, that's measuring stool, uh, um, uh, movement, sensory uh, uh, movements as well. So I, I've seen also in a, in a clinical trial, uh, one of the apps that's measuring MS sensory movements and how the disease is progressing with that without even the patient having to enter anything. It's just the way they move uh, is measured through that. And that's really amazing because some, especially the, the diseases that would impact cognitive skills, you can't really rely on the patient to input the data in such a case, right? So you need those wearables to be able to capture what's really going on and act accordingly. So I'm, I'm always fascinated by that, by that. And I think in the last few years, we've seen really big progress, especially with the, again, with the iWatch uh, clinical trials and, and a lot of things that go in that direction. Uh, 3D printing is also a very, very promising uh, area. So um, it can cut costs tremendously in, in so many, um, cases like uh, prosthetic uh, parts, for example. So it can really help people in developing countries or um, you know, uh, people that need some, something like this quickly uh, or something that is tailored really to their size. Uh, so you can really see a lot of development that's helping with offering better health, uh, being more preventive, being quicker in reaction and ensuring that you're really capturing things real time and offering personalized healthcare to people. These are the few examples that come to mind. This is all very exciting. And certainly we are seeing, um, especially in this COVID-19 world and the new normal that we're in, um, we're seeing you know, this, a, a global reset, an accelerant of some areas and some definite um, ex, you know, um, benefits financially, if you will, to a lot of the tech industry, but we're also seeing a lot of other things happening around us in the world today, political unrest, protests, um, health, uh, health uh, issues, and pe people being able to not even do things like being able to pay their rent, let alone uh, their, their health care. And certainly there, there's a question now more so than ever because of the pandemic, it was the issue beforehand, but I, again, I think there's a greater lens to it now, is people who don't have access, who may not have access to the internet or can't afford a phone um, or, or can't get that latest sensor or the Apple Watch. Are we creating a world of have and have nots with, with digitization and, um, and technology uh, interventions or implementation in healthcare? So yes, definitely there are disparities and, and of course the notion of the digital divide is out there and very present in, in research. Um, so uh, definitely there is a, a, a disparity out there. Uh, however, whenever talking about digital divide, there is also some research that showed that sometimes it's not just the divide that was the problem, but it's also how the tools are designed or adapted to a specific group. Uh, so for example, if we talk about age and a lot of research showed some digital divide there saying, well, the more senior citizens, they, they don't wanna go out of their comfort zone. They don't wanna change and they don't wanna do things differently. So they're not necessarily using those tools. But other research showed that if you actually train them properly and ensure that you're really explaining to them what they do, they end up preferring the digital tool over the paper-based one. For, for, for studies within median age of 80 years, you know? So it's not always the age. Again, looking at um, less privileged places economically, uh, one of the key problems was not actually sometimes the lack of phones, it was actually a literacy problem. Mm -hmm. So once you figure out that the real problem was not that they didn't have the phone, it was that they, did, they, wasn't, they didn't have the health literacy or literacy at all to be able to use it then you would be able to use visuals and like bigger fonts and colors to guide them through that process in a way that deals differently than your typical tool that you have in Europe, for example, because you, you are, you ha you're facing that problem far less in a continent like Europe. So sometimes when you go at beneath the surface, you realize that mostly most of those tools can actually be adapted to reach those less privileged groups or groups that might not be the most, um, the ones with the most technology affinity. 
but actually adapting the tools in a way that suits them still works for them. And, and research has shown that they would really, in most cases, they would prefer the, the technological tools over the, the traditional ones or paper-based ones. Um, so I hope this addresses your question a little bit. Yeah, that's fascinating and a very, very different way of looking at it. So I think that's uh, that's great. In the last few minutes, I do want to uh, leave with a question around pharmaceutical industry and you know the life science industry in general. One of the things that you also do as part of DigiBridges is educate companies in general about getting onto the technology bandwagon. Maybe you can share with us some of the pushback, some of the reticence, some of the uh, lack of adoption, and some of the, the strategies that you've used just to get your own clients on, on, on par with the digital revolution that we see ourselves around. Yeah, so, so of course there are very practical challenges like you know, different objectives within the different departments or different affiliates or, uh, you know, uh, conflicting interests within teams and so on. But what I have seen with such upskilling exercises where you really are offering things like landscaping and step-by-step -step guides and things like that is that they were very, very positively um, received. Because what I realized is that in most cases, the misunderstandings happen because of lack of understanding, not because people don't want to cooperate, but because they just did not see things or did not, when you say something, it doesn't have the same resonance for them just because they're not into the digital space. Um, so they have some free judgments about specific things. Like um, whenever I would try to talk to them about digital health, they would be like, no, 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 physicians are super stretched. They're gonna hate us if we talk to them about a mobile app, we can't do this. And they hardly even give me a chance to tell them, yeah, but you're offering with that app, you're offering seven months more overall survival for lung cancer patients. So what do you say about that? And then they're like, oh, what? What, what were you talking about? So again, it's the evidence base and, and really bringing the value. That's why encouraging creating such research is tremendously important for those tools. The more evidence base they have, the more arguments they can have to, to convince potential users and potential investors to come on board. So it's bringing this real value that makes them listen and say, oh, we actually want to do this thing. Lovely, awesome, I love it. For all companies that are listening and if you're interested in speaking with Christine about digitization, how to become, how to increase digital literacy within your organization or incorporating all kinds of cool new technologies, we'll be leaving all of her contact information, her company, in the show notes as well as in the uh, the email that we'll be sending as well as all the social media posts. So I invite you to have a great conversation, just like we're having this courageous conversation with her, talking about some leading edge concepts. We, as I was mentioning earlier at Impetus, believe that everything starts with a thought. And these conversations are what are the things that are gonna lead into these leading edge new positive disruptions in healthcare. And we at Impetus want to be the bridge, just like DigiBridges, but from a, a platform standpoint, asynchronous and synchronous ways of bringing different players on around the table, the digital table, to have these conversations, to be able to provide you feedback and ideas, how to move your digital strategy forward, how to collaborate, um, reimbursement strategies, all sorts of other things. We do that through our advisory board platform, the Impetus Insight platform. Get a hold of us if you are interested or potentially working with both of us. So thank you again, Christine. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And thank you to our audience for taking your time as well. I'm wishing all of you a wonderful day ahead. Thank you so much, Natalie.